Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be seated. In catechism class, we learned about the three uses of the law. But today, with the Pharisees, we see how human beings, sinful as we are, misuse the law of God. We have the Pharisees observe Jesus and his disciples as they walk through the grain fields, and the disciples pick some corns of grain and eat them as they're going. And the Pharisees see this and attempt to shame Jesus and his disciples, making note that it is not lawful to work on the Sabbath day. How often do we like to compare ourselves to others in a way to say, look, I'm not a, as bad of a sinner as you are, and so we choose to use God's law quite selectively, not against ourselves, but against our neighbor, to shame them, to put them down as if, if they are lesser than us, then we must be better. Well, if that's what it makes you feel better, I guess that's fine, but really what you only are is a better sinner, but a sinner nonetheless. The Pharisees, in their very tradition, were used to doing this sort of thing with the law. The Pharisees started out as the good guys. They were very concerned during the Greek invasions that the people of Israel not give up being God's children, that they not slide back into idolatry as they had before because they knew what had happened the last time the people of Israel turned away from the true God and turned to idols. And so Sirach and his followers, who came to be known as the Pharisees, decided it would be a good idea to take God's law and preach it in all of its truth and purity, but in order that the people of Israel would not transgress God's law, they would build a code, a fence, if you will, around God's law, so that if you don't transgress that fence, then you certainly won't transgress God's law. Sounds logical, sounds like a good idea. The only problem was it added on law upon law, and you know that where there are human laws, there are also always loopholes. And so these laws that the Pharisees created, these rules of conduct, while not necessarily bad in and of themselves, and maybe of a noble <laughs> desire, ended up being something that was burdensome and caused people to either despise God's law or to look for ways around it. The Pharisees were building fences where God had placed none. And whenever we do this sort of thing with God's law and we look for the loopholes, then what are we saying? Well, those laws apply to everyone else, but not me. And we start to rank people based upon how well they're able to keep our expectations of this code of conduct that we have invented and placed in place of God's law. We act as if God's law does not apply to us because we are better than others. And certainly the Pharisees were looking down upon Jesus' disciples today because they thought themselves better than Jesus' disciples, better teachers of the law, better Jews, better people. But that is a common temptation for us all, to watch the 24-hour news cycle or our internet news feed, to see all the horrible things that are going on out there in the world, and to think, well, at least I'm not that bad. 
But the world that we observe and all the horrible things that we observe in it is a world of human beings born of our first parents, Adam and Eve, just like you and I, a world full of sinners of which we must count ourselves in that number. Maybe you haven't done some of the horrible things out there, but you and I are certainly capable of them because that is the sin that dwells in each and every one of us. It is sin that transgresses, that breaks, that ignores God's law. But it is important for us, as Jesus points out to the Pharisees and his disciples and to us today, that God's law is always good. God's law is a burden and a weight upon us not because of God's law or his word, but because of our sin. It is a weight and a burden upon us because of our sin, we cannot keep his good law. And so our transgression, our sin, our trespasses are the burden that weigh upon us and the law then weighs down on us. But the law of God in and of itself is a good thing. God gives us his law to protect us. Consider the Ten Commandments. Each of those commandments either commands us to do something or prohibits us from doing something. But as you look at them, you can see that each of the commandments is actually protecting a good gift that God has given to us. The fourth commandment protects the gift of family. The fifth commandment, the gift of life. The seventh commandment, the gift of property and the things that we need to sustain us in this life. The sixth commandment, proper relations, one to another. The eighth commandment, your good name. The first commandment, our relationship with God himself. All good things that God gives to us and God desires for us to live and live abundantly in them. And so he gives us the law to protect them. God's law is good. It is we who are sinful. But thanks be to God, the law not only protects the good things that God has given to us, but as St. Paul tells us, the law acts as our tutor to lead us to the one thing needful to save us to our eternal life. No, it's not the law. The law doesn't lead us to itself. The law, rather, leads us to our Lord Jesus. And that is who the Pharisees come in direct contact with today, and is who, that is who we come in direct contact with today. Jesus says, man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for man. A Sabbath is a rest. And rest is a necessary part of life. God gives us the Sabbath in order that we may have this life abundantly. That we may rest even as he rested on the seventh day. In our culture, we tend to think of rest as a reward. I work hard all week and I get to rest on Saturday and Sunday and sleep in a bit. Even when church is at 9 o'clock. And my alarm is set for 10.30. But let's turn that around and see rest not as a reward, but as a gift. That rest is necessary in order for us to do our work. Just as is eating. God gives us this good gift in order that we may go out into the world and work on behalf of our neighbor and by so doing glorify him. 
In the Holy Church, this day, Sunday, the Lord's day is the day of rest. Not by sleeping in, not by staying home and surfing in the web, even if that includes watching this webcast, even though you could be here in person. So I'm not getting on the people who are shut-ins or who are traveling and who are watching us in order to be with us in that way. The people in the balcony, as it were. <clears throat> but who use the internet as a substitute for being in the presence of the Most High God and having the privilege to sit and sing and pray and receive the Blessed Sacrament with those with whom they will spend eternity. Sunday is a day of wrestling, not by going to a game or a family event. Sunday is a day of rest by going to the banquet hall, the resting place of the church. And that place is wherever the word of God is proclaimed in its truth and purity, and where the blessed sacraments of our Lord Jesus Christ are celebrated as he instituted them. In other words, church. This is the place of our rest. This is the place where we both end and begin our week. This is the place where our Lord feeds us on the Sabbath day. Proper resting and eating is found no place other than in Jesus Christ our Lord, in Jesus Christ our Sabbath. <clears throat> True rest is found in the word of Jesus Christ that leads us to repentance, that turns us from our sinful ways and grants to us the forgiveness of sins. Can I confess my sins to God anywhere? On a hike in the woods, out on the golf course, at PNC Park, or console, or PPG Paints Arena? Yes, and I often have to do that in those places. But the trees and the golf tee and the hockey players and the baseball players will not speak a word of absolution to me. Jesus Christ gathers us here in this place to be where he acts and where he speaks his forgiveness to us. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there is life and salvation. We are refreshed on the Lord's day, in the Lord's house, among the Lord's people, in the Lord's presence, in the most blessed sacrament of our Lord, where he feeds us with food not just a few grains of wheat to tide us over to the next meal. Not just a meal to fill us up for the day, but with the food of immortality, his very body and blood, given and shed for us for the forgiveness of sins, to grant to us life and life everlasting. This is our true rest, dear friends. Jesus, God's good law, has brought us to this place, telling us to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And we do so by gladly hearing and learning God's word. For the law is our tutor, has brought us to this place, and this place is where Jesus is. And where Jesus is, we find our Sabbath rest. And in him, we find our sustenance and our hope for life everlasting. For Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is the one who has done it all for us. He has lived for us, he has died for us, and he has risen again. That we may live with him and walk in that newness of life. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. This congregation has got to learn to say amen. amen. Thank you.